started. So welcome to the Rock Talk Cafe by Les Après Cours. So I'm Robin. I'm one of the people that hosts this. Uh, Mark, you want to present yourself? I'm Mark. I'm presenting myself. <laughs> Also one of your hosts? <laughs> I'm also one of your hosts. I'm a consultant with DRC for vocational training. I'm happy to be here. And? Kishar. All right, third musketeer. Hey, bonjour. Kishar Pecho, agent de développement des applicants. Je suis votre hôte. All right, so welcome, everybody. Today, so just before, oh, before we get started on our topic, just a, a little reminder that on the Apricot website, everything that we're sharing with you today, the recording of this, the summaries, the, the, the archive of, of the notes, it's all available on the Apricot website. Um, you just go to the article of the, of the, of the top of the trade and you can see that 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 each recording has its own web page at the top right you'll see the collaborative document that's where i'm going to take notes so if you want to follow along if you want to add your own notes this is this is a spot for everybody um, the resources are at the bottom of the of the of the screen you'll see that any of the resources we mentioned will be housed in 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 a document located there and remember to sign up for the calendar just by clicking on the plus next to the google and it'll sync with your work calendar so you can can see every Monday what the topics are about. So a quick word, remember this is a pilot project. So anything you have to say is really important. We want to hear it because it'll help us improve our, our uh, this, this activity that we're doing. And we want to make this a space for you. Okay, so today, December 4th, we are going to talk with the auto mechanics sector and we want to talk about navigating labor challenges, insights for recent graduates. And we're doing a series, this series, on labor relations in the different trades, kind of in honor of what we're all going through in a society this, this past fall uh, between the public sector and actually the auto workers were, uh, they were on strike in, in, in the summer and early fall. So <laughs> this falls into this, this theme very nicely. And it's about preparing our graduates for, for the workforce, not so much for skills, because that's part of what they have to learn, but also understanding workforce expectations. So today's goal is we want to situate sort of this critical perspective of worker rights and expectations. Um, so uh, not only like what the workforce is expecting from the worker, but what the worker is expecting from the workforce and how that fits into a continuum. We want to identify some government websites and, and industry, I should put also industry websites for support, not just government ones. And we want to discuss all this, some of the, the, the findings and some of the, 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 the elements that we're going to bring up. And we want to discuss this on, 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 and how we're preparing our students and especially our non-local students for the Canadian workforce. Good to go. Right on, Leprechaun. Let's get started. Ça marche, Pontiac. All right. Navigating labor challenges, insights for recent graduates. So when we look historically at the labor situation, you know, kind of growing up, we always heard about strikes and we always heard about this union negotiating with that entity. And, and a lot of this comes from, so there's a historical perspective in all this. And unionization started in the automotive sector in the 1930s. And it accumulated, you know, getting, gaining workers' rights and into the 1960s with the major uh, uh, United Auto Workers Pact in 1965, which really helped stabilize that industry and ensure a, a longevity of the workers' rights in that industry. But of course, not long after that auto pact of the 60s, we hit sort of the, 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 the next wave of, of the, rev the industrial revolution. And this has a major impact on uh, not just auto manufacture, but also auto repair and mechanics. And it's uh, about reorganizing and restructuring and actually creating new jobs. And this is what's been what's been historic, like in the last 50, 40 years, this is really what's been affecting this sector. And when we look at this, this historical labor situation, there's always this link between workers' rights and workforce expectations and worker expectations, right? So workers' rights a lot had to do with protectionism and making sure that the worker was uh, working in a safe environment. And, and, but it also had to do with ensuring that the, that the worker would also have a longevity to their job 
and a longevity to pass their job as well with uh, retirement packages. And uh, just add it, just a, a little note there, the Canadian Labor History website, even though it's like circa 1999, so it's, it's not very fluid, it's actually got a lot of really great information about sort of the history of labor relations, both unionized and non-unionized. So it's actually a, a great site to go get some information from. Now the current situ labor situation. So what's interesting is that that when you go to St Stats Canada, is they really divide auto mechanics into into two sectors, and it it kind of goes half into the manufacturing sector and half into the service sector, because there's the the auto mechanics and like uh, motorized engine repair that's inside the manufacturing sector of the automotive industry. And then there's the service side, like the repair of personal cars or the repair of construction, uh, uh, commercial enterprises, cars and trucks and whatnot. And when we look, so, what, so Statistics Canada really do, divides those two. And then, so if we're looking just at the, the service element of it, um, what was really interesting there is that, that that sector is mainly small business owners. So less than 20 employees. And it's some, like, it was hard to sift through the data, but it's like, it's up there close to 90% of this work, the, this, this industry is small business owners, which I thought was pretty incredible. And that might give an indication as to why the, the, the current industry 4.0 with automation and, and EI and the, uh, AI and, the, and, and um, the computerization of this world, why it's so disruptive, because automation has been extremely disruptive for this trade. And the, the nature of the jobs are changing. So it's not just that, that the tasks are being performed by uh, uh, automation, which is what you see in a lot of other trades. In this case, like there's actually entire tasks that are being eliminated. There's jobs that are being like new jobs that are that are coming into existence that didn't exist before. Um, and and you're running into the automation paradox, which is where because things are becoming more automated, people get less practice on them and therefore don't develop skills in the workforce. And right now we're putting all the training for this, this advancement in this industry in the workforce. And so there's this sort of paradox happening. And so it's a very disruptive time for this industry. And with that, if you look at the last five years, um, that, that this is, these statistics are similar to us in the cooking world here is that 50% of their young workers are leaving the industry. So they're getting the training, they're going out, and then within, within five years, they're leaving. And this could be from a lot of factors. It could be from that disruptive nature of the trade, how it's very, very unstable. Um, and it could also be that the lack of diversity inside these small businesses, because these businesses are struggling to adapt to the speed at which stuff is changing, there's this lack of diversity. So they move on to either the same trade, but inside uh, a more... Um, uh, a, not advanced, but a quicker paced situation. But that, I didn't have the data on that one. Um, it could be that. Uh, we don't know exactly why they're leaving. It could be because of the reputation of the industry that could have an effect where we always, you know, that's that thing that we always deal with in vocational training where, <laughs> where you know, everybody's like, oh yeah, that's what you do when, when you can't do the academics. There could be that associated with it. But yet we know that the, the, the amount of skill involved to become a mechanic is incredibly high. And, and we'll see that on the next slide because it's actually a lot of these mechanics are being poached by other, other sectors. Um, the apprenticeship, cost, so to become an apprentice can be expensive and initial wages are kind of low to start with. So this might explain why we're getting a lot of attrition. And so, like I said, like the other, but the other, one of the other interesting things is that it has like uh, auto mechanics is a really good entry point and it has incredible transferable skills. And so if in the actual initial industry, we're seeing that 
um, there's struggles and that there's dissatisfaction, there's a lot of other sectors that are huge and growing where these students or these entry workers can get jobs. And so they can go over into the manufacturing sector, like I mentioned, or into aerospace, which is huge, the construction industry, or even uh, like the service elements or the inspect, like being an inspector uh, uh, of, of the actual automotive trade, because they have skills like diagnostics and preventative maintenance and repair and verification and visualization of complex skills, right? And these are all like incredibly easy to transfer over to, to, to different sectors. And when we look, so the Canadian Apprenticeship found, Forum found that for the next five, four years, five years, we're looking at in Quebec, we're going to need over 20,000 people that have become skilled workers just to sustain the workforce. That's not to grow the workforce, that's to sustain the workforce. Because what's interesting is if you look on the, the statistics I found for uh, new car, car sales in Quebec is in the last 10 years, new car sales have plummeted. What that means is one of the things we could we could we can extrapolate from that information is that possibly people are keeping their cars a lot longer, saying, which means they're going to be in more need of repair. So we need more <laughs> auto mechanics out there. But when we look at, and this is an Ontario statistic, I didn't find the Quebec statistic, but since 2016, we've actually declined in the automotive technician workforce. And I know that looking at the t statistics, you always look at Stats Canada, you can see that like that those COVID years, the, those 18 months of the initial um, uh, pandemic were really hard on this industry. And kind of like the food sector, a lot of people left and went elsewhere and went into other sectors. And so they're having a hard time getting, bringing back people into this sector. So and so the so, so combing through Stats Canada, I found this presentation that I linked to in 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 the um, in the resources. So you can go take a look at it because we're always talking about, especially in an urban environment, the, our international students. And what's really interesting, and there's there's three slides that I pulled out of their presentation to share, is that. What's really interesting is that we are entering way more people into Canada in the last few years than we ever did before, like exponentially, and you can see this. But what's interesting is that when you look at the third point, <coughs> our international students are not going into post-secondary uh, education as much. They're going into labor force or training for the labor force. So we see that in, you know, in the early 2000s there, it's 7% going into training. And now we're sitting at almost 60%. And we see it in our classes, we see how many international students we have, or how many new, new, like new immigrants, non locals we have. And this is like, this is huge, but we can see this is just going to continue to grow. So the other thing is, so those are the our international students, um, but it's also indicating that that more of these students are transitioning from having a student status to permanent residency. And although that higher skill uh, TFW is a um, uh, temporary uh, foreign workers. So although higher skilled temporary foreign workers, and they divide higher skilled as uh, higher skilled means a university degree or higher and, and lower skilled is under university degree. So the higher skills, like there's more permanent pathways. There are more pathways to apply for permanent residency because that's more of a traditional route. But, you know, in the last 10 years, the, the federal government has woken up to the fact that we need more workers in this country. And they've opened up a lot more non not traditional routes now that will eventually become traditional, but uh, you know, logically, but so, so we see that, right? Like, uh, and we've seen that with some of the combinations of our programs, putting these two programs together gives you enough hours for you to apply to get some points to apply for your permanent residency. So we see that and we see that, that, that the rate at which people with these lower skills are transferring over uh, to permanent residency is really, really increasing. So with that, I'm not going to read all this, but what I think is interesting is, as we'll see in the next slides, is that 
that these temporary foreign workers and these international students are, are making up a huge chunk of our workforce, but we know that there's challenges in getting them ready for the workforce. And the barriers are not just about the skill set that they have to acquire, because a lot of them are coming with a skill set that's that 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 is transferable, but they're not getting recognition. And so what we're finding is that 16% of Canada's workforce is overskilled for the job that they actually have. And when we think that 22% of our workforce is foreign born, there might be a correlation there that, that would be interesting. But we know that, that there, there's more than learning about the actual skills of a job in order to be... Um, uh, in order to integrate into a workforce, there's understanding how a workforce works, what the labor relations are, what's expected of me, what I can expect from my workforce, what I can expect from employer, uh, the role of a union or unionization and all this. And I know that when we're teaching, we often teach about the role of say an SST, but one of the things we might teach less about is the role of a professional organization. Like I, I don't think in auto mechanics or in motorized, uh, mechanics, there's no professional order, but there are definitely professional organizations that help promote the trades. There's also part of this sector is unionized. If you're inside the manufacturing sector, you are unionized. And if you're not, then then there might be areas that are becoming unionized. Or the, But to understand the role of a union and why you would take a job in a unionized environment and what that would do for you and, and the, the relationship with that, that might be stuff that we're not teaching as much. Or maybe we are. And this is the part that I'm kind of curious about. And this is the part I'd like to have a discussion about. Because we know that that although both our foreign born or non-local students need to be educated about workforce rights, worker rights, expectations of the workforce, it might be that our that the, the that the non-local students would benefit the most from understanding this historical context and situating this uh, in 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 where it came from and where it is today and where it's potentially going and with the skill set that they're bringing in. Sure. The, um, I always planned this uh, in advance, and I was uh, reading, was checking out the Twitter feed of the Quebecois magazine uh, Ecole Branchie this morning, and then I saw them that they posted the, the, about the, the French version of an article, and I went like, oh, I need to talk about this. So it doesn't it doesn't relate directly to what we were talking about, but um, it's on on the conversation. The link is going to be in, is in the presentation. It's going to be clickable. Uh, Australian uh, professor John Hattie did a meta analysis of 2,100 other meta analysis to observe what are the tactics, st strategies uh, that uh, really impact uh, students' learning, trying to focus, to shift the focus from the teaching to the, to the learning. Uh, so, of course, he talks about, so he published it in a book called The Visible Learning, the sequel, because he's continuing a reflection that he started 15 years ago in a previous book. But let me read you what he writes in this, the conversation article about the use of technology in education. We've been told for 50 years, the answer to our education problems is technology but my analysis shows the overall effect remains low. We have used technology as a substitute, videos instead of papier mache, word processing programs instead of using pens, online activities instead of worksheets. So often the powers of technologies, technology are really, really exploited. There are major messages from the huge body of studies that they surveyed about technology. My book, not my book, but John Hades' book, highlights some of them, including the importance of students learning from each other via technology and the value of technology in providing multiple opportunities to learn. Social media is also an important way for teachers to hear what students are thinking. Many students will talk about how they are thinking, where they are struggling, and ask questions about their work using social media that they will not do verbally, even when their teacher or peers are staying, standing beside them. 
I thought it's bringing in a very interesting approach to using technology in education. It asks very pertinent question, and it is rooted in overall the experience of over 400 million students across the planet in uh, mostly in uh, developed countries. So food for thought, a little uh, quick read on the, the conversation and maybe a book to buy to read uh, all about it. So it originally published in uh, March, 2023. So it's very recent. That's what I wanted to bring today. Okay, all right, thanks very much. All right, so to continue the discussion, go ahead and go to vt.proceed.ca, sign up, join, log in, join the trade group and keep the conversation going. Post some resources, discuss with your colleagues. If you need a hand, go ahead and use the chat button. All right, uh, take a moment to fill out the exit ticket. It helps us um, improve the Vok Talk Cafe and deliver something that, that, you, uh, that you can engage with and that meets your needs. Um, and if you also, once again, if you have an idea for the Vok Talk Cafe, let us know. Of course, if you need a hand, give us a contact. And there's your link to your resources. And that's what we have today. There we go. So thanks for coming, everyone. Mm -hmm.